Yeah, thanks Marco, thanks for having me. Um, I could talk for hours, so I tried to compress it in 25 minutes or 20 minutes, so bear with me and um, I can provide, or I, I sent you the slides already, so you can uh, look up the links. What was it? This way. Okay, first, because it's the first presentation of the day, I thought a little tech recap to warm you up might be, might be nice, even though I suppose that most of you already know what containers are, but just um, two views on container technology the lens of first of the stack. So in both cases you have hardware, of course, to container to virtualize on. In traditional virtualization, somehow, yeah, maybe like that. So in traditional virtualization, you have, of course, the kernel on top of the hardware to access hardware, um, the hardware. Then you have your user land, which then consolidates or comprises or concludes the, the operating system. On top of the operating system, you have some services like mail servers or what have you, or SSH daemon. And in this case, I choose a type 2 hypervisor like VirtualBox. And this VirtualBox hypervisor will provide you an emulated, um, provide you emulated hardware so that you can install the same shebang that we see here, a kernel and a user land on top of this hypervisor. So in essence, it's like a kernel again, a user land, and the services you want to run in the first VM. And for the second VM, it's the same. It's a kernel, it's a user land, it's a services that you want to run in the second VM. So, and, and by doing so, of course, you can run Windows on top of Linux, and Linux on top of Windows, and Ubuntu, and all this jazz, because it's totally isolated, and the hypervisor makes sure that no one can talk to, um, that, that the first VM cannot talk to the second VM, and even is not aware that the second VM existed. In container virtualization, it's a little bit different. We have the same kernel, of course, and user land and services, but all this operational abstraction that is used in traditional virtualization is just passed, just uh, skipped. So we don't have the hypervisor, we don't have an additional kernel, but we use the kernel of the host system and put a container on top of, those, of this kernel. And we containerize the user land and the application, and only the user land and the application that is needed to run this application and we don't need an additional kernel, we don't need an abstraction that provides us with isolation. Because the kernel, since a couple of years now, provides us with isolations like namespaces and I will talk about namespaces also in a bit. Another view that I like to also put after this slide of the stack view is the interface view. Um, here I, I choose a hypervisor type 1, so it's a kernel, it's a user land and it's a hypervisor baked into one piece. Um, this interacts interfaces to the hardware directly with hardware calls and it provides uh, the hypervisor functionality and the hypervisor also provides an emulated um, emulated hardware. This emulated hardware then houses the kernel and the kernel can talk to the hypervisor with special calls. They're called hypercalls. And uh, hypercalls are pretty reduced. In Zen, for instance, there are 30 or 40 hypercalls, so it's, it's uh, built to isolate uh, virtual machines, so it's rather um, hardened and it's like, quite old now as well, a couple of years, 10 years or so. And on top of those uh, kernels, you can either directly talk, um, yeah, you have to, to use this call, so if you use, for instance, Python, you use a script, and this script relies on a runtime, the Python runtime, to interface with the kernel using syscalls, or you can uh, steadily compile a binary with Go or with C or what have you, that also uses syscalls directly with the kernel. And the same applies as in the previous uh, slide. With containers, we just get rid of all the hypervisor and additional kernel stuff. We just use the, the syscalls to interface with the kernel and um, the binary or the script and the runtime or the dependencies needed to execute the, the script or the binary. Um, needs to be con containerized, needs to be packaged in a container, and this can then interface directly with the kernel. So we get rid of all the abstraction here and the overhead. One slide about namespaces. <coughs> we have seven namespaces in the kernel. There are, is an, an RDMA namespace is also present. There's thoughts about time namespaces and so on, but what's supported by most container runtimes is those seven namespaces. If you start Linux for a long time, you, you had all these namespaces. So if you do ps minus ef, you use a pit namespace to list all the processes and the process IDs. And if you start a container, you just spawn a process um, with his own namespaces. So you cannot see processes that are on the host. 
even though if you're on a host, you can see processes of the container. So if you do ps minus ef within the container, you only see your executed command and all the, the um, processes spawned by this. But if you do this ps minus ef on the host, you see all the processes that's also uh, running in the containers. And this feels like virtual machines to some degree because you cannot, you, you have this isolation feature where uh, the analogy to virtual machines break is if you share namespaces. And this can be done, and we saw this um, by talk from, from Tim and the others that they don't, don't use all the namespaces, they just use namespaces from the host. So you can use, for instance, the PID namespace of the host, you can use the network namespace of the host so that you have the IP address and the host name of the host within the container. And what you also can do is you can share namespaces between containers, which is heavily used by Kubernetes. If you start a Kubernetes pod, the first thing Kubernetes is doing is creating a, a container with nothing else to do than provide the namespaces. And on top of those, uh, this pause container, you will create your Nginx or you will create your, your services or your containers within the pod. OK, so this is like a recap. And if you look at YouTube, on YouTube, I have a couple of talks where I go in more detail here. But I just wanted to like warm you up with container stuff. <coughs> this is the most important slide, I think. Um, and this is a slide that I showed like for the last year, I think, or a year and a half. Um, because I think that there is a convoy from GPU to HPC anyhow, even though maybe some of or most of the, 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 the guys uh, are not aware of it. Um, because there will be, yeah, there will be a, a, a path, a, a way to HPC um, when you start using GPUs. Why is that? So currently in Docker, for instance, we are in the non-GPU phase because GPUs are not a building block within, within the Docker ecosystem, even though there's work and you can use schedulers like Kubernetes, which allow you to do some GPU stuff. But it's changing, um, and the first step that is necessary is the beginner stage. I, tell, I call it the beginner stage, which we see with NVIDIA Docker, for instance, where you can use hardware uh, acceleration like GPUs with local storage and, um, and yeah, simple storage. This is why NVIDIA sells its DGI, DGX boxes a lot, right? So this is uh, a lot of GPUs, a lot of storage, like 30 terabyte of NVM, NVMe RAM, uh, NVMe storage because they don't want to access data from, from the outside world. They want simple storage on a, on a host, and they want a lot of compute. And for this, you just need hardware access. And this is what NVIDIA Docker does, right? It provides you with the ability to access the devices of the NVIDIA GPU, and it also provides you with means to match the driver on the host with the driver within the container. And we also heard talks about uh, MPI, for instance, in Finiband, that was the same, essentially the same thing. You need the driver on the host, the kernel driver, and you need the user land driver within the container. And most of the runtimes, they just reuse what is installed on the, on the host to allow the GPU or InfiniBand to work. <coughs> and this is a rather simple step. I, I toyed around with it for the last year or so, or a year and a half. And I had some prototypes. And I'm currently, in, at the end, I, I have some links to GitHub issues or GitHub pull requests I opened. This is not very complicated to do. It's just a means of baking it into the OCI spec and making sure that we have a compliant and standard way of accessing these things. The second, uh, the second um, step, um, I call the intermediate step, is where we still have a single node, so all the GPUs that you have in your, in your host, but you might have a, a model that needs to access a lot of data on a shared file system, or that wants to output a model to a shared file system in order to collaborate with different users. And for this, we need data access. We need secure data access, which is also a little bit cumbersome with container technology as of today, because you need uh, Docker volumes, for instance, or volumes, which are basically mount points for all the containers that you run. Each container has its own mount point, And within HPC and AI, we know that we don't want to have mount points for all the processes. What a user expects is he logs into a host, and he has an NFS share already mounted, or a Luster share already mounted, or GPFS share already mounted. And the access is just um, granted by the POSIX interface of the kernel. So you have an ID, a group ID, and a user ID, and with this, and additional GIDs, and with this, you can access the data. So that's something that needs to be, um, yeah, it needs to be dealt with as well. And these two are things that can be done by the runtime, and we see why the advent of a lot of other runtimes that it's possible. 
Um, this is homework that the runtime needs to needs to to do, and I think that's possible. And as I said, I I work on the open source part of the Docker ecosystem to work. The third thing, of course, is um, the advanced stage. It's uh, distributed computing, and in this case, MPI. I think is most prevalent one where we have multi-node code, like distributed AI, distributed TensorFlow, um, and shared storage. And this is the, the third and the final stage uh, where we, we, we will arrive when we start using GPU. And if your model is too big to run only on the GPUs one node provides you, you need multiple nodes. Or if you want to uh, leverage the file I.O. that multiple nodes provide you, you need multiple nodes. Or if your financial advisor tells you that the DGX is too expensive, and wants you to use commodity hardware, then you also need um, multiple nodes. So you need some distributed computing, uh, you need data access, and you need the hardware access. And surprise, when we have all three of those, we are actually in an HPC job, right? Um, and as I said, multiple uh, nodes with MPI, data access, and hardware access, boom, you have HPC. So that's when I tricked everyone into HPC by just leveraging the uh, momentum that AI provides us. The first one, it's, as I said, it's already solved with Kubernetes. It's not native to, to Docker, the Docker ecosystem as of today, but it's not super complicated. Um, there are two aspects of uh, hardware access. First one is easy, it's uh, device access. So if you have a GPU, you have a couple of devices that are provided by the uh, kernel driver. You have this NVIDIA couple and NVIDIA UVM device that provides you with access and some, some uh, control over the GPU. And this, the uh, third device is the device that gives you access to a certain GPU in your host system. So normally, if you have only one GPU, you have NVIDIA Zero, for instance. And if you map this one into the container, all three of them, you can access the GPU as if you would be uh, on the host. If you have a second GPU and you run, want to run a, a second container using the second GPU, you can do this mapping. And then the second container can access the second GPU without interfering with the first GPU. And this is nicely done by the Kubernetes device plugin. Pretty easy, pretty straightforward. And the same applies to MPI, or to InfiniBand, or OPA, or TPUs, or whatever um, accelerator cards you have. If they use devices, you need a kernel driver, and you need to map these devices. Um, another thing that's rather easy, um, that's why I, why I slip it in here, because I want to talk about the, the focus should be on the, on the second piece of this hardware access, is uh, Shared file system access, at least one um, idea or one, one approach to do this would be to map the user ID and the group ID within the container. So if you are Bob, that your processes are forced to be run as your user ID, so that if you access a shared file system, the kernel will provide you access via your user ID and group ID. So it's the same access model that you have outside of the container. And this should solve a lot of uh, the current problems. Even though I'm talking to Michael Jennings, he had a MythBuster talk on at Stanford uh, last month, and he claimed that this is a little bit faulty, so still discussions. But I think that's at least one approach to do this, and one simple approach to do this. A second approach to do this is, as well, rootless Docker daemons. Um, there was a pull request uh, recently uh, in Mobi, in upstream Docker, to allow Docker to be run as rootless uh, as user, as unprivileged user. And there's an example how this is done here. So you run the Docker daemon within your own user namespace. So a user can run a Docker daemon and then access the API of his own uh, Docker daemon without the need of a user, a root user, to start the Docker daemon for him. It's pretty nifty and pretty uh, straightforward. I'm, I think it needs some more experimentation and research uh, because you have to map, you have to know in advance the user that's running within the container. I think that's kind of a little uh, drawback here. If you have a different user ID here, 1000, for instance, you see that for the kernel, the user <coughs> is not your user. It's a different user with an offset. But that's to be discussed. I mean, that's, that's an option. Um, but there, I think, needs, needs to be a little bit more, uh, more researched. I think this approach is a little bit more straightforward. But that's just me. <coughs> and while we're at it, and this is a provo provocative thought and just trolling a little bit. Um, I hear a lot, or, and I heard it for like the last five years, actually, from this very get-go, that the root daemon is a problem. And my opinion is always that, was always that, what is Slurm daemon other than the Docker engine in its infancy? Like, Slurm starts a process on behalf of the user, 
and the Docker daemon starts a process on behalf of the user. I mean, it's, of course, Slurm is much older than the Docker engine and has a lot of thoughts and a lot of uh, contributions from all over the community, so it's a little bit more mature, like to say the least. Maybe the Docker engine has no focus on, on this kind of, of uh, scheduling, but in essence, my opinion, it's just the same as, as a Slurm daemon. It starts a process on behalf of a user, so I don't know, I don't fully understand the fuss about it so much. Okay, but back to the beginner stage and the, the, the focus of the talk, <laughs> and I'm like 10 minutes left, but I think that should be fine. Um, as I described, the device part is pretty easy and done by the scheduler. <coughs> this, the second part is much more important. It's first, it's image lifecycle and uh, the hardware, the match between the driver of the kernel and the driver of the user land. What do I mean by image lifecycle? If you s look at a discipline like, for instance, AI ML, that's like the focus, as I said, or the, my first approach here, but it could be um, matched to HPC workloads the same. You need to come up with a way to um, compose and create your Docker images or your container images in a yeah, reasonable fashion so that you don't have everyone create images all over the place, that you reuse code and you, uh, you silo up different aspects of the container and provide it to the, the experts of the field. For instance, here we have the base image underneath with different uh, flavors and different configurations that might come from the operational folks, the operational staff. Then we have a, a domain um, what was it called here, domain uh, template. So the expertise within a certain field, for instance, uh, computer vision or, um, or a reinforced learning. So particular fields within your organization they might want to create and want to create a layer that installs all the dependencies they have. On top of that, you have different frameworks in AI like TensorFlow and PyTorch and all the rest. So this is a field of the expert of the framework and this is like stacked on top of the domain um, template that is provided by the domain experts. And depending on what you want to do and which stage you are within your, your workflow and where you want to iterate on, you have different uh, interfaces on top of those. So for instance, if you do AIMI, AIML, you first want to provision a host, you want to create a container to toy around with what you need in your domain template, for instance. Once you are fine with your base image or with your image, you want to start training and tuning your, your, um, your image and your model, maybe using Jupyter Notebooks so that you can interactively develop your model. Once you are fine with your model, you want to train your model with a lot of data, so it's more a batchy job, so it's not an interactive Jupyter Notebook anymore. It's uh, just scrape, uh, kick out the Jupyter Notebook and use some, some batch processing to train the model. And once it's trained, you don't need all the dependencies of the training anymore. You just want to inference this using, uh, using something like Kubernetes in the cloud or whatever to be able to use the model that you just trained. So you have different stages. And within these different stages, you just don't want to put everything on top of each other so that at the end, the model that you deploy has also Jupyter Notebooks, has also the dependencies for the batch scheduler. You want to compose this image in a, in a serious and a nice fashion. And there are links to uh, this, uh, the, the, um, the pictures provided as well. And this, of course, I mean, composability is key for making the workflow work. Uh, very nicely and make sure that you have a, a repeatable and a, a workflow that serves your your use use uh, the, your users and the workflow itself is just using this composability to allow for certain aspects of the workflow to be run efficiently and and automated and here we talk about or I, I, I yeah I glossed over it but in that's why I'm what I'm talking about in the next slides is that in this picture they use different base images for different GPUs, and I want to get rid of this different GPU piece. This is what I'm talking about in the next <laughs> slides. Um, because what we see now, as with, with NVIDIA Docker and with Singularity and all the rest, they just map the user land driver, which is the user, the CUDA toolkit in, in CUDA terms, to uh, within the container so that they match the, the driver on the node. So within Ubuntu, for instance, you install the NVIDIA driver, Media driver 39644, for instance, is a driver for 92. And within the container, within your user land, you install the CUDA toolkit 92. And then you can run TensorFlow on top of it. If you run a TensorFlow that is compiled to be able to use all the um, <coughs> minor versions of, of CUDA, then you can create a TensorFlow that works with all the 9.x versions of your, your CUDA toolkit. And then you can run on multiple nodes 
without recompiling your applications again, right? But the problem here, in my opinion, is that within the container, the TensorFlow container, you, uh, you break the immutability by just mapping in the CUDA toolkit from the node. I think that's, that's not good because you cannot test it. You have a dependency at runtime, which might break your code without you even knowing it. And this is, I think it's bad. <coughs> what, um, it's better, and this is like because I <laughs> because I, I'm proposing it, so maybe that's I'm, I'm flawed here. But what's I think objectively better is to have the two good toolkit to the container because then you can run the container in read-only mode, so you cannot change any file system anymore, and you can better test this or even test this at all because your TensorFlow with container is de not depending anymore on the host toolkit be mapped into the container at runtime. So you have some, you have a testability, reproducibility by baking this in. The ugliness here is, of course, <coughs> is, and I think I have it here, that you need to encode the different dependencies at runtime into uh, your, your name. That's what, what it's done by a lot of folks uh, as, of, yeah, t as of today, right? So for instance, here I have a, a computer vision TensorFlow image that just is compiled without any CUDA or whatever. And it's not optimized for my, for my CPU even. So if I run this image, um, TensorFlow will remind me that I have a, a modern CPU that it's not leveraged by TensorFlow because I haven't compiled it with all the, um, all the flags. I can create a TensorFlow image that has Broadwell uh, in it, so I can optimize for Broadwell at compile time, and then this uh, error will go away. And uh, I also created an image here that is optimized for Broadwell, and it's also um, a CUDA 9.0 image. But of course, since my host has CUDA 9.2 installed, so the kernel driver version is 3.9.6.4.4, it complains that I cannot use the GPUs because I have a wrong a mismatch between the CUDA versions. So what should I do? I create an image that runs uh, CUDA 9.2. So I have the CUDA driver uh, of CUDA 9.2 within the container, and then boom, it works. Not because I have compiled it with the latest um, capability to um, GPUs in mind. So I, I compiled a TensorFlow and a CUDA that is only able to run with the latest CUDA uh, cards. So I had to recompile it again to be able to run with the KADIF or M60 I have. So I have a uh, a Broadwell optimized NVIDIA capability 5.2 optimized uh, image that runs CUDA 9.2, and now I can use the GPUs. So I have this encoded, the specifics of the host encoded into the, um, the name. Of course, it needs CI CD, and this is what I, what I would like everyone to use, anyways. Don't use this manually, don't try this at home without CI CD. And by doing so, I can run optimized containers, which are specific for a certain host. But I have this name ugliness. And what is the, the uh, fix for that is using the platform feature within images. So you all recognize if you, or you all experience it, if you install Nginx, for instance, um, or if you use Docker on, on Windows and on Linux, and you download an image that has two different images for Windows and Linux, you don't have to specify anything. You just do Docker pool Nginx, and it will download the correct version for your host. The same goes for architectures. If you are on an ARM and you do Docker pool Ubuntu, you will get the Ubuntu version with ARM support. If you are on x86, you will get the x86 image for ARM and so on. This is done by manifest lists. And what I proposed in the image spec, um, the, the GitHub repository, because it's already part of the spec, is to have a flag where you can specify host-specific and hardware-specific things. For instance, here I specify CUDA 9.2 and CUDA 9.1. And if I'm on, on both hosts, I just need to download my TensorFlow image. And depending on, um, on what host you execute this, it will figure out, OK, I'm on CUDA 9.2 and on CUDA 9.1, and it will download the correct image without magic. Uh, <coughs> And this is done with a set, is with, with a manifest list. Manifest lists look like this, um, that you have an image that is a representative for something. For instance, here it's a Kneep, say, CFTF, yada, yada, the image name. This one you can download. And depending on what host you are, you will match one of those, of these three images. And in the case of my GPU box here, I specified within the configuration of the daemon that I want to have the Broadwell feature the NV Compute feature 5.2 and the CUDA driver 9.2.
And since in the image list I have this, in the image manifest list, I have this feature match here, this one will download this image without me specifying all the specifics. It will just download this image when I download the image name on above. The same as that, the same mechanism as with uh, ARM and x86 and so on. And what needs to be done here is uh, a, a little pull request in image spec so that the feature is uh, created. Then I need to uh, do the matching in Containerd and then do uh, a little pull request in Mobi to make this available. I, I had a, or I have a, a version that, that does this in a more hacky way. And what I'm currently trying is to make this in the upstream versions, make a pull request. And I have links to the pull requests uh, below. Also a blog post where I talk about the motivation behind this. And um, yeah, I hope that this goes through the next couple of weeks. And yeah, let's see. As CJ said yesterday, there is a, a workshop, an HPC container workshop uh, at the ISC that I'm hosting. And CJ will be part of it as well. So saves the day if you are at, at the ISC that you are uh, extending one day and stay for the workshops as well, because we will have a full day discussing all things containers. And that's the fifth version of it. And yeah, it's going to be awesome.